Welcome to Community Express. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman, along with Deanna Zachary. Today on the show, we'll take a look at how to spend your money locally this holiday season to boost our local economy. We'll also see a video from local filmmaker Kyle Tierman. It has gone viral on YouTube, and it's called Shop Local, Surf Global. We'll visit the Homeless Garden Project for some beautiful and tasty gift ideas. Then it's on to food and feeding those who don't have enough of it. We'll talk with the folks from Second Harvest Food Bank and the Gray Bears about how their efforts to be the hungry are shaping up so far and how you can help out. Also, we'll finish our three-part series on the Poganip Trail proposal by talking to city representatives about plans to make the park a safer place to hike and bike. All that's ahead on Community Express. Deputy Chief of Police Rick Martinez and Sergeant Dan Flippo from the Santa Cruz Police Department. Also Danette Shoemaker, Director of the Santa Cruz Department of Parks and Recreation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. We're Thank here you. to talk about the Poganib and the new trail that's proposed to go through it. I thought first we'd start out by setting the scene of what the Poganib is like um, in terms of crime and what this trail hopefully might do. Um, we'll start out with you, and just if you could just paint the scene of what kind of crimes go on there. Is it really a dangerous place, or is that just a media creation? Well, over the last several years, we've seen an increase of uh, narcotic uh, sales and drug activity in the areas of Poganip. Um, the activity was originally controlled by um, gang members that now have, it's kind of funneled down to other gang associates. The, the crimes is mostly over the heroin drug trade, and what it's brought is um, you have people selling, but then just a high volume of users. We've had people come from far out as uh, Modesto to purchase narcotics in that area. Is there a sign somewhere this way, <coughs> Poganip, you know, get your product? Uh -huh. Is there an internet site that's advertising, or does it the, the underground network just word of mouth get people I, to come there? I believe it, it was such. A, it became such a volume that the word of mouth became that was an easy place. It was it was relatively secluded. It was hard uh, for the police to get a presence in there. So you had people coming from all over to, uh, to purchase the narcotics, and with that you get. Um, you know, with the gang members, we've pulled uh, firearms off of people in there. They used to, uh, even recently, where they, wherever they were doing their narcotic sales, they would stash firearms. Uh, we have arrested people that were bringing stolen firearms up into that area for trade. And then, in addition to all the drug use, you have all of the just human refuse that gets left behind. I mean, you, large volumes of just garbage. Um, anywhere from food items to, I mean, it's really different than, say, like a homeless encampment. You really have, uh, you know, needles, all the stuff to use and cook, um, and then people will just kind of move into there um, to use, not to live, but to use, and then whatever debris or refuse they would bring, they would leave into that area. And, and what percentage of calls do you think <coughs> of all of Santa Cruz end up sending you there? I mean, is this a really here we go again kind of situation for the police department? It's not really a high percentage of calls that we receive for the area. What makes it difficult for us is the environment itself. It requires a team of officers to actually go in there as a group in order to conduct any enforcement action or respond to calls, period. So it, it does make it uh, difficult for us to police. Hmm. Simply because of the you know the environmental. <clears throat> and how danger dangerous is it for people to walk through the park to be hiking through the park? Well, for the most part, we haven't seen any you know attacks on people just simply walking through the park. But you know, there are several hazards that are posed, whether it's discarded needles, um, armed conflicts that may occur between drug users and drug sellers. I mean, as uh, you know, Sergeant Flippo mentioned, you know, we are seeing a, a substantial amount of firearms uh, seizures coming out of the park itself, which gives us great concern. Also, uh, there's a substantial fire danger, danger when you have people uh, processing and cooking uh, heroin in a heavily wooded area, which is, you know, just 
tons of fuel you know, within that park, it, it poses a great danger as well, but no specific attacks on, you know, hikers or people walking through the park. That's a little bit comforting, but I have to say, you know, Danette, in the history of Santa Cruz, can you back us up a little? What was Poganip supposed to be, besides a beautiful thing to look at from afar? Is it supposed to be heavily used by the citizens of Santa Cruz as a parks and rec opportunity? Absolutely. Poganip was purchased um, through a bond measure, um, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically to round out our green belt. That's 640 acres, and our vision was that it would be a series of hiking trails, some multi-use trails, um, eventually a community garden, a homeless community garden, hopefully someday a restored Poganip clubhouse. And uh, I just want to point out that the portion of Poganip that we're talking about is a little less than 100 acres, so we're not painting a picture of the entire Poganip. There are still um, areas of Poganip on the established trails that are still wonderful uh, for families and individuals to use and heavily used um, by legal citizens of our community. So there's about 100 acres where there's this activity, the drug activity. And, and tell us about the theory behind this trail. It's a mile and a half trail, and <coughs> the theory is if you put a trail, you'll get more bikers, more hikers, and the, the folks involved with drugs will move? Well, initially we tried to close off that 100 acres to help the police department with the enforcement um, once it was posted and closed. Um, trespassing was not allowed. But after a year of that, um, <clears throat> the activity, the illegal activity, just wasn't reduced as much as we had hoped. So as staff, we started talking about other ideas. And as recreation professionals, we know that bringing people into a distressed area, um, doing legal activities, often moves that along. And that's what our thought was, that if we could um, Establish this mile and a half trail that would connect with the rest of the trail system in Pogonip, it would increase the activity in that portion of Pogonip that's been closed for over a year. Let me direct my questions to each of you. Um, this theory, I guess they call it the broken window theory, you go into a community, you spruce it up, you paint, you get you know a community garden in there, and then you get people, families, you know, to go and just be there. Does that work? And do you have examples of other communities in which? this has worked, you know, the kind of clean up the neighborhood plan um, that you're aware of in other jurisdictions that you've talked to? I can just speak from my experience. I've, I've been with the city for almost 20 years now, and, and the neighborhoods, let's not look at a, a neighborhood that's broken, in the but any neighborhood where the neighbors know each other, support each other, and call out when there's a problem tend to be your safer neighborhoods. Tend, you tend to have less crime there. And, and what we have in this smaller portion of Poganip is you have an area that even prior to this date, there was no legal trail through a portion of this. And so now there's a spider web of, of trails that are just being used for this illegal activity. And you have no one that's really going down there that's, that can be our eyes and ears, other than when we get an informant. But usually when a person comes to us, it's after the fact when, you know, we talk again about violence, when they say, hey, you know, these guys are starting to beat people if they don't pay on time and stuff. So those victims don't call us necessarily we find it out from others so it's not as deputy chief was saying there's not a high level of reporting to it but the neighborhoods where we get the public looking out for, for each other is usually a safer neighborhood but it's not a neighborhood it's an open space so what do you right, do right. then but you know any area that's yeah. that's a problem for policing you know that has that level of participation or an increased increased level of participation from you know the residents or the stakeholders is of great value to us mm -hmm. uh, then you know we have those eyes and ears out there calling us when they do see those problems on a regular basis and we can respond to those needs so that level of participation really you know ensures our success one concern, though, that I had was, why wouldn't the folks just move a little deeper into the woods? You know, if there's a path going through, they go behind the tree. You know, that, that seems like an obvious, because if, if I'm a heroin dealer and I have my clientele, they know I'm going to be there, it would be more difficult to move far away and keep my business going. So why don't I just move a little away from the path? I can actually answer that question. Part of it comes down to some simple premises of commerce. The, we did, for a while, have so much pressure up there. It did take great man hours and, and, and officers uh, to go up there. Um, but we were able to push them out. And the dealers did try to move further out. And what they found is that the customers, so to speak, didn't want to hike that far <laughs> to go get their product. They, they, wanted, they wanted to be closer. So it did work out where they hiked significantly farther away. But then it, 
the, pretty soon the dealers came back. They wanted the convenience of a fast they food the stop off place. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, ease of access. <laughs> exactly. you know. they, don't also, they also don't want to be observed. And sure. what this trail will provide, it will provide access for parks and recreation staff and police department staff. I noticed the levee is a good example because there didn't used to be a really nice bike path there and access for the Santa Cruz Police Department to drive along the levee and that seems to have helped uh, somewhat. Mm -hmm. Although as a walker, I have to say that I don't feel entirely safe there yet, despite the fact that a bicyclist might whiz by me as a walker, but mm -hmm. um, the slowness of walking makes you, I think, much more vulnerable. And there were people just off the levee in bushes, so I'm not sure it would be significantly more different but your access point does give me some confidence. Some of the best information, using the levee as an example, some of the best information that we get or my team will get is from a, a bicyclist that frequents that every day and says, hey, every day at this time I'm observing this. And that allows us then to direct our resources at the appropriate time to where this activity is occurring. I'm wondering though, um, kind of the big picture on dealing with crime and heroin, because maybe maybe if the theory works, you put a path through there and they move somewhere else, but the fact is they're moving somewhere else. So it becomes, you know, okay, now they're there, we have to do, you know. What's the big picture of what really works around drug addiction and sales uh, to, to decrease it? You wanna? Obviously rehabilitation, you know, when it comes to, you know, addressing the, the, I guess the addiction within our community, we've definitely uh, could use a lot more you know, resources for that. We, we can't do it simply by enforcement alone. You know, we've brought in you know, federal resources to help us address, uh, you know, drugs and gangs within our community, not only in Poganip, but, you know, in our downtown, on our levees. And we've had uh, success, but now we need to, you know, <coughs> treat the users themselves. And we've always kind of fell short as a community on the rehabil rehabilitation side of it. The fund is just not there. Mm -hmm. And you know we need to really start focusing our resources toward that, because you're never gonna be able to do it just by putting people in jail. Mm -hmm. But back to cost, I'm curious how much a bike path um, might cost and whether it, its sole reason for existence is crime prevention, whether it's you know gonna be a positive benefit for bicyclists. Um, how do you weigh these sort of different aspects of a project in order to sell it to those who would spend the money in these hard times? I'm sure these decisions get made with quite a more skeptical eye than they might have five Well, years the ago. initial intent was solely to bring people back into the, the Poganip, that area of the Poganip that was closed. As far as co costs go, until we get the go-ahead on it, we will not have a design where we can do cost estimates from. But we do know that um, there's a great offering from the community a whole series of volunteers from the equestrians to the bikers to the walkers that have stepped forward and said that they'll offer um, people power and equipment to help us build that trail. But we have not gone so far as to get a cost estimate until we find out if we can get it approved and get the master plan amended. And where are we in the political process of moving forward right now? We've gone through um, the initial environmental review and taken public comment um, on the proposed trail for 30 days and about that same time the project um, manager took another job outside the city so we've kind of slowed it down a little bit and what that's enabled me to do is continue to take public comment because what I want to be able to do is address as many of the concerns that um, people that don't support the the trail as, as possible because people are very passionate on both sides pro and con trail Mm -hmm. So we have, we've slowed the process down. We'll go back to City Council sometime after the new year, but we don't have that scheduled yet. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because at the same time the city's considering this, they're embroiled in this uh, really much even longer dialogue about Aronic Gulch. That's and true. they're both bicycle paths. You would think if you took your bigger view, bird's eye view, that Santa Cruz would be incredibly on board with bicycle travel because it's such a bike friendly community and yet you've got the same people who like the idea of bikes who are considered environmentalists questioning bike paths. I find it an interesting political conundrum to be in because I would think places like Boulder and um, you know up in Haley, Idaho around Sun Valley they have this long bicycle path where you can go from three or four communities on a bike. And I would love to see Santa Cruz do that, but I am watching the politics, and they're not as you would think they would be. That's very interesting, and it changes from day to day. So what are some of the strongest arguments against the trail? 
I believe some of the strongest arguments are um, whether or not the city should undertake a, a full environmental review rather than a, a focus just on this trail. Um, and concern about the environment, um, concern that, uh, as Rachel said, that this trail may push the problems into other area. And also there's an interest in a, an alternative trail using um, the rail line. Mm -hmm. And that's not the city's jurisdiction and maybe even more complicated than getting a trail through the city process. Mm -hmm. And it would not address our concern of opening up that 100 acres to the community. Mm -hmm. And is the big issue really heroin? Is that, is that what the issue is or is it all kinds of crimes? Or is it really focused on heroin? I'll let Dan address that question since he's you know, in the field you know, seeing these problems on a daily basis. Well, up there, it's definitely the heroin trafficking. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, you have people going up there to, to trade in stolen property. You have people there that are going there and in, in, in getting high and then coming closely into the Harvey West Business District and into the downtown area. A lot of the people that have police contact in the downtown corridor are going, would go up into there to score their, their drugs, get their drugs, and then come back into the community on that. So. It really is, that's, it, for a while it was like an out of sight, out of mind type place to deal with it, but the impact really creeped into the, all these other neighborhoods because that's where the people were committing other crimes to get their, their goods to do the trading up there. And would you recommend to folks to not be walking in that area right now, not be bike riding? Not at all. I mean, the more people that are in that park, the, the more uncomfortable it's going to be for those drug sellers and drug users. You know, we're at a point right now where we've, we've had an impact. We've arrested some key players uh, in, in that drug trade you know, within the park, and now we need to start backfilling it with some use and some and some people <coughs> in there to utilizing those those legal trails currently in order to make it as uncomfortable as possible for those drug users and sellers. But that area is still closed, so we don't yeah. want to encourage people to go in the closed area. Yeah, legal trails, but, as I mentioned. <laughs> yes, but the other 500 plus acres, absolutely. And just a minute left, um, I wonder if you can paint a picture of your ideal Poganip, you know, five years from now or whenever we've solved some of the worst of our problems, what would it look like in terms of human use and enjoyment? Oh, a wide variety of use from hikers and bikers and equestrians, all ages, um, people gardening, people just enjoying nature. Going to the clubhouse again. Oh, wouldn't that be <laughs> yeah. wonderful? I went to a wedding there years ago. It was a beautiful building. It I is. Hope it, it lives again. It's a beautiful space. I used to ride horses up in Poganip as a park ranger and worked for Danette for many years. Yeah. And ultimately, we want to get to have families be able to go anywhere in the park yeah. and not have to hide from this one sliver because of this, this type of activity. Well, let's all keep our eyes focused on that time, and thank you for all you're doing to make that come about. Thank you to Deputy Chief Martinez, Sergeant Flippo, and Parks and Recreation Director Danette Shoemaker. Thanks for coming on the show. And next up, we'll see a video about the Homeless Garden Project's holiday gift store in downtown Santa Cruz. Garden Project was really a place for people, to, homeless people, to get off the streets during the day. And um, at the time, the shelters weren't open in Santa Cruz. It was 1990, and the, um, Paul Fotenhauer and Paul Lee just started the shelter program in the churches, satellite shelter program. And there was nothing for people to do after they got out of the shelters at 6 a.m. in the morning. We created the garden to give homeless people a productive place to go during the day. First thing that happened was that uh, Paul Lee brought homeless people up from the shelter to the Pelton Garden. And at that time, it was just one of the community gardens that was provided through the Parks and Rec Department. And he had 300 herb plants to put somewhere. And we brought people to work up to create an herb garden with the plants. And then we saw this beautiful field that was there and realized that um, there was this donation of 400 strawberry starts that um, would be given to us that was on a bet, on a dare, that we couldn't grow them organically. 
So we decided that we would plow the field and put the strawberry starts in. And the fortunate thing at the time was that we had uh, a lot of help from the local organic farmers and the people who had worked and trained up at the UC Farm and Garden. So we plowed the field and we put the starts in and then the city came to us and said, oh, you can't use that land. And um, that city property, you need to get permission to do that. And so we went very systematically through a city process, um, writing a lease and going before city council till the city actually gave us a one-year lease, temporary, and we um, grew strawberry starts, strawberries, organic strawberries that year, and they were beautiful. WOF is the Women's Organic Flower Enterprise, which is one of the three enterprises at the Homeless Garden Project. And its primary um, role is growing dried flowers throughout the growing season, the spring and the summer and the fall, and in harvest, the dried flowers are um, brought to the workshop. And the beautiful wreaths are made by our trainees. And um, beeswax candles are made as well. And those are some of our best um, income producers for the project. And it also, the production creates jobs for people during the winter so that when we have to take people out of the fields because of the rain, we can bring the workers into a big production workshop. And the, the wreaths, as you can see, are here. And we're so happy to have another retail store do donated this year downtown. Well, we have a three and a half acre farm out um, near Natural Br Bridges and so the main two crops there, I went and visited the farm and worked for a while, at, are lavender and the strawberries and so a lot of the things that are made here in the store come from the lavenders and strawberry pro products and then a lot of the flower teas the, the teas were grown that are boxed up here, and the wreaths are all dried flowers that are grown at the garden. So that's pretty much what's here, is either outright um, donations, things generated and made from the garden, from the seed to the final product, which all involves the homeless community and volunteers, and then the uh, consignment goods. And um, this storefront was donated to us for two months through Christmas Eve. And so that was a grand thing for us. With us now is Chief Development Officer for Second Harvest Food Bank, Danny Keith. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And also Director of the California Grey Bears, Lynn Francis. Thank you for being here today on Community Express. Thank you for having me. So it's the holidays, a lot of people's attention turns toward what they can do to help people who don't have enough food amidst all the plenty you see on TV and the advertisements for turkeys and turkey dinners. You have people who are going without meals. Can you paint a picture for us um, in the middle of this recession, which most people still feel is the middle, not the end, um, what our food situation is like in Santa Cruz County, how many people get enough to eat and how many don't? Uh, well, we've definitely seen a significant uptick in the last year um, regarding the f number of working families that need food. Um, right now we're servicing about 50,000 people a month with over half of those being children. Um, a lot of it is coming from people that had traditional work and maybe they were put to part time and lost their benefits. Um, a lot of working families right now are needing some support, so that's really where we're filling the gap. Hmm. How about gray bears? Um, you getting a larger? Well, our numbers have doubled in, in the last past in the past year. So we serve wow. about four thousand seniors a, um, a week. So we do our week our brown bags uh, every week for forty eight weeks out of the year, and um, we've seen a significant increase. And we expect in the next few years to be serving ten thousand seniors. Wow! And several million pounds. Of yes, about two point five million pounds of fresh produce. And this is just in the last couple of years, this kind of increase. Yes, right. Huh. What are you hearing from seniors? What are they saying? That their Social Security uh, check isn't going far enough? Oh, of they're, course it isn't. And then they have to make the decision between what they're going to buy, whether it's going to be uh, pet food, medicine, pay their utility bills, or buy food. And buy food is always the last thing. So our brown bags really help to supplement their food supply. A lot of people think, okay, so holidays, I'm going to focus on giving something back. Um, what kind of opportunities are there for the general public to 
help out? Do you want this food year, or checks or what would you like from this year? This year's uh, you know definitely the biggest time of year for us. I mean, we get you know almost two thirds of our raise is happening in the next well in the last 60 days, um, and that'll actually take us through the first part of the spring. Um, and so a lot of events, you know, like we had the lighted boat parade, we had snow day, we, you know, a lot of people get creative. Um, Plantronics does a huge food drive for us. So the community really comes together and gets creative at this time of year and everything from cash to donated food. I mean, just like Grey Bears, we distribute quite a bit of fresh fruit and produce a year. And so the money helps us be able to acquire that at a really reasonable price and redistribute it back out and provide families nutritious food as well as food that they are unable to actually secure. So. And I know you have these big barrels around town, but what if someone doesn't live near one? Is there a way to just write you a check? Sure, you can, uh, you can either send us a check out directly to Second Harvest Food Bank, or you can go online to thefoodbank.org, and we have multiple donation channels online that we have seen a, you know, an uptick in donations online, actually. So uh, that would be the easiest way is if you would like to donate cash. And every dollar we raise actually helps us feed a family of four. So I was going to ask, that's a long way for a dollar to go. You really well, stretch it. <laughs> we, um, between the food that's donated through the food drives and events, through schools and churches and whatnot, and uh, the produce that we work you know, out deals with the Ag Against Hunger and different farmers um, really helps us keep our food costs low. So. Wow. And you're seeing the numbers just go up and up and up. Is there any lessening because people talk about maybe we're slowing down in terms of having such economic troubles or are you not seeing that? Well, after the summer, we thought we saw a little plateau um, mm -hmm. and then our numbers in October and November were up by 35 percent. So, um, I, you know, I think as the economy remains unstable and jobs are being lost and shifted, uh, I think we're going to continue to see upticks um, at random times for people that are needing food. And, and really that's you know, Second Harvest Food Bank, while we acquire the food, we work with over 200 agencies and drops um, monthly to provide food to those people. So we're kind of an emergency net um, for those people that just have nowhere else to go. And you're kind of working together, right? Um, the Grey Bears work mm -hmm. with Second yes, Harvest? We're, we're a that food work? agency of Second Harvest, and we are able to purchase uh, food at discount discounted rates. And how do you get it to seniors? I know a lot of them are not mobile, so how do you? Oh, we have a very intricate network. We have a hundred di different uh, routes that we have volunteer drivers for. So we have 50 sites throughout the county and then another 50 shut-in or um, delivery sites to homebound seniors. Mm -hmm. So, um, w and we, we rely mainly on volunteers, so volunteers are the essence of what makes Grey Bears uh, work for us and cost efficient. And how do seniors find out if um, they can get on your list if they're not yet? And, and is there sort of a shyness factor they have to get over in order to get on your list for delivery? Well, we, we rather than think of ourselves as a charity, we like to think of ourselves as an organization that, sh that shares the bounty of the Tri-County area. We live in the salad bowl capital of the world and the ag community has been very generous in donating to us. They donate that 2.5 million pounds of food that we rely on and they actually make sure that the seniors are, are fed adequately. When you say the ag community, so they, they planted too much lettuce, so the extra lettuce they goes... They pl always plant a little extra for the food banks and for gray bears. We're not quite a food bank, but um, mm -hmm. we're similar in a lot of ways, but uh, quite independent. And Danny, where, where do a lot of your resources come from? Do um, supermarkets give you extra food? Is it the federal government or is it mostly individuals? How, how, where does it come from? It's all three of those. I mean, we get um, you know a lot of our produce through Ag Against Hunger and different um, agriculture partners. We get cold grade produce, produce that just doesn't make the grade for shelf. Um, supermarkets, there's two dates on food. There's an expiration and a use by. So we have work relationships with the different um, local grocers and national grocers that bring food to us, um, either it's dented cans or um, just shelf life expired foods. Um, and then a, you know, a good chunk of, of what we raise comes from the what we call micro events, just local food drives, kids doing birthday parties and taking food instead of presents and you know, people throwing barbecues and asking for food to be donated. Uh, tonight we have uh, the inauguration of Ryan Coonerty, his uh, after party, all those funds are going to be donated. So the combination of those three really helps us, you know, this goal for the holiday season is 2.1 million pounds. Um, and we distribute annually over 7 million pounds of food with about half of that being fresh fruit and produce. So, 
And we hear a lot about the high obesity rate amongst low-income in people in the county, especially Latinos in South County. So a lot of the concern is that it's, it's cheaper to go to fast food, buy fast food, than it is to cook healthy meals. How do you deal with those issues? Are you going in new directions about really making sure the food is healthy? Well, you know, I, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, that's a whole other topic as far as like people using convenience of food. Um, you know, one of the, if you will, silver linings of the cloud of this uptick and people needing help is we're able to, you know, educate the people about nutritious eating and, and how they can, you know, provide a healthy investment into their future and, and avoid future medical costs. Either they're bearing those costs or the community's bearing those costs. And so um, we do a ton of nutrition outreach. Um, we send, you know, out when we do our, I think, about 50 food for children drops, um, we go out, we have recipe cards, we have um, our AmeriCorps actually makes some of the food that we're distributing that day into a recipe and you know and then the kids that are there we actually provide exercise you know jump rope hula hoop whatnot because um, sometimes these families don't they barely have enough room to live let alone let the kids be able to get any activities so um, yeah I mean we we're definitely morphing from just a food bank into more of a food bank nutrition bank mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard, uh, and this is a really different angle and way, but it connects right with what you're talking about. I read a statistic somewhere about how much food people waste at the dinner table. And we all got raised saying, think of the starving children in China or Africa. And of course, the comeback from the kid is, but how would you send them my potatoes? <laughs> right. um, but the attitude um, that you don't have enough unless you are throwing away something off of your plate is sort of a new part of American culture that maybe got lost after the World War II greatest generation that was very frugal. And then we went into the super size me world where throwing away food seemed okay. Um, so one of the thoughts was we could turn all this excess food into energy through composting, but that still seems like an incredible waste. If 40 or 50 percent of the food is going down the garbage disposal, couldn't people take that food and donate it to you before it gets used at all and just cook less? I mean, how do you instruct the public how to be more frugal with food if we're really just chucking half of what we cook up? And that could be going to not Africa or China, but maybe downtown Santa Cruz. So how do you instruct and educate people around the waste issue? Well, I mean, the waste issue is a whole, that's a difficult topic to touch on. but. You know, I would encourage people, you know, to come down to Second Harvest Food Bank and take a tour and see how efficient we run. I mean, between solar, um, all of our uh, destroyed food or food that goes bad actually goes into compost, and we didn't take that compost and redistribute it out. Um, I think, you know, for people to stop wasting food and to be focused on, you know, eating, you know, I always tease, I tell people, you know, I don't eat what I totally like anymore. I eat what's sustainable and keeps me healthy. And I also eat in portion control. And so I think people learning that they have to eat appropriately and that um, realistically, if they do have extra food, you know, it is nice to be able to, to donate that or to, you know, make a sandwich or, you know, pass out some food to somebody that's on the street. Um, it's just a, that's a that's a whole other topic to really get into because I, that's starting to control people's comfort zone. And I think people really need to get out of their comfort zone to really realize how much they are wasting. Hmm. Well, in an affluent society where waste is considered an example of affluence, um, it does beg the question, how can you have such a disparate uh, income level in the same community? And I don't think people always see the people who are hungry because you can't see hunger. I mean, we're not like Africa where you see people's ribs showing, so it's not always evident. But I think teachers see it a lot, and people who work with seniors see it a lot in low energy kids who come to school and they can't focus and they admit they haven't had any breakfast or dinner the night before. So it's not visible in the same way it might be in a, another country. I think, and to get the information out about um, complementary foods like uh, rice and beans and corn and those things where you don't need a lot, but just to mix them well so that they're nutritionally balanced. Plus your fresh fruits and vegetables help a lot. Uh, I don't think seniors have that problem as much as other people because they are more frugal. But um, we, we see it, we pick up a lot of um, leftover food from various restaurants and uh, supermarkets that are, that are a little outdated and we give that to volunteers and they're always very happy to have it. We always provide a fresh um, 
fresh hot meal for our volunteers so that we feed about 40 or 50 volunteers a day. That may be the only food that they have for the day, but that's mm -hmm. what we do. And then you're retiring after 25 years yes. at Grey Bears. What, what have you seen change at Grey Bears of, 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 you know, over the 25 years that you've been there? Well, I've, I've seen the concept of uh, going from being a charity to being a place where uh, we're an extended type family hmm. evolve so that people come in because they want to give back to their community. It does, they don't necessarily have to be a senior to volunteer, but they want to give back, they want to help, they want to uh, support what we're doing because w whatever monies we generate, and we just had our big Christmas dinner and we fed about 2,300 seniors, um, whatever we generate from that goes back into the brown bag program. Everything we do is for the brown bag program. We run a thrift store, we do e-waste. We have four earth tubs that we compost in that we sell uh, the product dirt cheap back to the community <laughs> for their gardens. And we run two recycling sites and all that goes to support the brown bag program. So. It's our main goal. So I and important for folks to know about the e-waste, you can bring your old computer right. and old electronics and yes. you'll do something with it. <laughs> so I've seen so much more support over the last 10 years or so where people of the baby boom generation are eager to volunteer because we give classes, there are ways for them to participate, they can learn or they can teach or we have cooking classes, computer classes, Facebook classes, we have Spanish classes, we have exercise classes. And we it's been proven that people who volunteer and give actually get an endorphin high, mm -hmm. it's better for their well-being. So if you're thinking right. about ways that you can give this holiday season. Here's two organizations that will give you your endorphin rush and let you know you're doing something that will go directly to our community. So um, I just want to commend you both for the work that you do. I don't know who's going to be taking over the reins for you when you leave, but I'm sure it will be in great hands. Yes, it so will. any final thoughts about how people can plug in? It's not too late. By the time you see the show, they can still chip in. Just a quick how to get in touch with you and what to do. Well, I think on the note of volunteering, I mean, most of our organization is driven by our volunteers. And as we see these people needing help, mm -hmm. um, they're usually the first ones that come back through and volunteer. So while we're seeing an uptick in need, um, a lot of these people will be regenerated as volunteers when they get back on their feet. Um, to, to provide some help for the holidays, um, I think, you know, put, do an event, you know, how, substitute your birthday party for food donated or, you know, throw your company party and take the proceeds to and donate it to Second Harvest or Grey Bears so that we can continue to feed people on a lower budget and uh, and stay frugal ourselves and, you know, handle the uptick that we're seeing. And, you know, it's definitely been a strain on us, you know, as far as like our resources and our capabilities, our, our overhead is fairly low. So we really rely on volunteers. So if you really have no other idea of what you really want to do to help out, then contact us at uh, Second Harvest Food Bank and we can put you to work sorting food or delivering food or you know helping us pack produce bags. And likewise with Grey Bears, you can donate on www.graybears.net.org, sorry, <laughs> 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 which one is it? Um, and uh, what I, this is our food drive time of the year as well because um, we need money for our, to put on our Christmas dinner, which we just had, and to fill the bags and whatever donations we get now, uh, we'll take you through the us, whole year. Sustain us for a year. Well, so. thank you so much. I want to thank our guests, Danny and Lynn, for joining us and for all the work that uh, their organizations are doing to help those who are in need in our community. Next up, it's a look at how to keep your money circulating in the local economy this holiday season. This is a short film by local videographer and pro surfer Kyle Tierman about shopping local. Sometimes I get overwhelmed when I think about all the problems in the world we face today. But I learned about one simple thing I can do to help my neighborhood and the environment at the same time. 
our economy is, is in a lot of trouble and one of the things that we're seeing is a huge rise in unemployment and unemployment is bad for the economy, it's bad for the security of our neighborhoods, it's bad for our emotional health, it's bad for everything. It's just, it's not a good situation. When you buy from local stores, a bigger percentage of that money stays in the community. When you spend $100 at a local store, 45 continues to circulate in the local economy, whereas only 13 stays in the community if you buy from a box store. If you buy from a multinational corporation, the bulk of that money is going to its headquarters. That money is being siphoned out of your community, so we're bleeding our communities dry while we're enriching the coffers of some far-off multinational. I know when I buy a sweatshirt at my local surf shop, that money that I spend there is going to be spent again in the community and it will continue to circulate here, eventually just creating more jobs for Santa Cruz. And that money then can go to providing good schools, providing good, healthy, clean, green jobs, keeping our own neighborhoods healthy and strong and vibrant. Even when you're buying locally, aren't most clothes still made in other countries? I was thinking about how I'm affecting people all over the world when I buy a t-shirt. So I took this idea a little further and made a trip happen with award-winning photographer Daniel Russo. And we're off. Sri Lanka is an awesome country with great waves and cool people. It's also one of the largest clothing exporters worldwide. Daniel and I visited a factory and I was surprised to find out that because of consumer pressure back home, conditions are improving for Sri Lankans at this factory. It's basically they're just being treated much better and they're being treated like human beings rather than being treated like machines. Would you not pay an extra buck for that shirt if it meant that you knew that the workers could actually support a family and weren't living in some shanty town somewhere? Without consumer pressure, companies have very little incentive to change their practices. When you buy a t-shirt and let the store owner know that you care about the people who are making it, that's how change happens. It's the same with environmental conditions also. So I drove down south and asked my sponsors what made them start thinking about the impact their company has on the world. The turning point was seeing Yvonne Chouinard speak. It just inspired us to come back and change and we immediately came back and went right into producing organic t-shirts. Surfers don't understand the power that they truly have to, to make a difference by what they purchase. So purchasing from a company that is doing right by the environment. It sends a huge message to the industry and um, trust me, companies are paying attention. We make skateboards, so we cut down trees. Uh, it's important to us that uh, all the wood used for our skateboards um, comes from forests that are sustainably harvested. You're making an impact either way. Um, you know, you're sending a, a message to the companies um, that you don't care or you do care. It's not about being overwhelmed and burdened by new information that you've got to carry around. It's about being liberated. It's about being able to see a way forward in life, about how can I live my day-to-day -day life in a way that's positive for the planet, positive for my neighbors close by and on the other side of the world. Traveling, I realize that most people in the world don't even get to choose where they shop. They're just dealing with surviving on a daily basis. It's actually a privilege to be able to choose who you want to include in your economy. So buy locally and shop responsibly. It's simple and it feels great. I'm here with three board members of Think Local First. We have uh, Carl Hyman, he's the co-chair of Think Local First. Also Michael Olson, general manager of Talk Radio KSCO. And Eric Gill, he's the owner of The Sock Shop in downtown Santa Cruz. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having Thank us. You. But we're really not bored. <laughs> That's good. good we're excited good. board members. <laughs> what are you excited about? I'm excited about the uh, growth and development of our little Think Local First movement. The, my compatriots here and, and I and, and others have uh, worked really hard and, and it's so wonderful to see the community uh, joining in with us. We now have, what, 520 members? That's correct. Yeah. 
So what is Think Local First? And what do you think of that video? Does that tie into what you're promoting? Yes, it, because it it's focuses on, on thinking local and the impact of thinking local. I think it did a pretty good job of that. Yeah, Think Local First is an organization that's a member organization that's a nonprofit run by all volunteers. And our main mission is to spread the word about thinking locally first before you buy something. And we're not an organization that says, don't shop here, don't shop there. We're an organization that says, if you're going to buy something, just think about buying it locally first. And um, a lot of people don't do that. And it's just a simple concept that we're trying to do because the benefits of the economy and the community are just incredible. So Tell us about some of those benefits. <clears throat> well, there's financial benefits, as you saw from the uh, So if you spend $100? Locally, about $45 of that stays in the community versus $13. And uh, we just ran a local CHEP campaign, which was to highlight that, an example of it. And we had five local banks that put out $100 each. We gave them away. And the people that we gave away to had to spend that within 24 hours for a month. And it generated about $7,000, five people, locally for this community. Now, that's about 0.000018% of the population. <laughs> so if you do the math and you say 1% of the population did that for a month, it could generate $20 million for the local economy. So you can go by economy of scale and, and do that. And, and I think it's one thing that the movie didn't point out. You know, they encourage you to shop locally. But what it didn't point out was the compounding value when people, other people think locally as well. Think Local First has two objectives. One is to encourage the community to think local first when making their purchasing decisions. But second, and even more important, is to encourage our member businesses to shop locally as well. Now that's where the magic and the formula comes in. Because when you just shop take your hundred dollars down to somebody's shop and give it to them and spend it, that's nice because the money is in the community. But if they take that money and spend it at a chain store, it's gone. But if they take that money and spend it at another local business, it, that one hundred dollars becomes two hundred dollars. And that's where the magic comes in and that's the demonstration that Carl was talking about. Uh, the value of that hundred dollar check compounds day to day to day. So $100 becomes, uh, gee, what, <laughs> it just keeps growing. Yeah. It, it can be $3,000 at the end of, of uh, a month just by circulating once per day. Yeah, and Eric, what does that mean in, in terms of your sock shop? W what are the kinds of yeah. benefits that you see about people, um, you know, kind of from the ground? Yeah, uh, uh, the sock shop, sock, sock shop example is, that somebody spends $100 on shoes in our store, a percentage of that stays in wages, and uh, a much larger percentage of that stays in me needing bags from a local supplier, going to uh, Palace Arts to get office supplies. I use local advertising firm. I advertise locally. Um, I, I really, especially over the last three years, being part of Think Local First has raised my consciousness, and it's good to see uh, somebody like Kyle Tierman as a young guy really getting it because we vote with our dollar every day and we've been slowly undermining our own economy by giving our dollars to businesses that take most of those dollars out of town really it's about the recycling of that dollar that's what economy is is the dollars changing hands between each other and the more money kept here the more likely it is we're going to have more jobs and a better economy I'd also like to add that everything that we've just been talking about is kind of the economic side of it, but there's a whole other side of it that we try and portray too, and that's the community side. Uh, we try to, with Think Local First, build a unique, special community where business owners know one another, people that go into the shop know each other. And the last thing that we want to do is turn Santa Cruz into a cookie cutter mall type thing that you see everywhere else. And, and I'll give you a good example that I've used before that if you want to get away for a weekend with a significant other and you're thinking where to go, you usually don't think, well, let's go to Union City for the weekend or let's go to Fremont for the weekend. Um, you think, let's go to Carmel, let's go to Mendocino, let's go to Carmel. And, and the reason you do that is because those places have unique shops, unique communities. 
you know, you're not going to go to a Union City because it's all strip malls, right? And certainly we want Santa Cruz to be one of those unique places. And if it has a whole bunch of unique locally owned businesses, um, it's going to do a lot for the people and the community. Mm. You know, there's another layer of that, too, um, that people may not think about, which is sales tax. And, mm. and we are in a obvious time right now when you look at the state budget, which is reliant or local yes, governments on exactly. sales taxes to fund basic services that um, with that boosts um, local. When you shop online, unfortunately, a lot of Internet sales are not taxed and do not go back to the state or local government. So you're basically giving it to Minnesota or wherever that person That's resides. Right. There's been some attempt to try to capture that and enforce it so that some of that money comes back. But really, internet shopping, and, and it's a tough sell because it if is. you can buy something on the internet half the price that you can buy it at, at your mm -hmm. shop or yeah, your shop, it's a, a very lot of tough competition. What people don't understand is that when, <coughs> when you buy online, like you said, none of the tax dollar comes to the community. All your money goes out of the community. But you don't think about, well, you have to pay for shipping. Right. And then a lot of times, uh, and I found this to be true when I go to buy stuff and from my suppliers, is that if I go to them and say, hey, you know, I can get this over here for this much, I can get it over there, they will match the price. And you would be surprised how many business owners will do that. So, um, you know, I have a saying that cheap food isn't. And um, I think, as a matter of fact, it's the great lie of the food chain. People, and people agriculture brags that we have cheap food, but if you look at the true cost of that cheap food, it really turns out to be quite expensive because they make food cheap by taking the nutrients out of it and by subsidizing its costs. And that's kind of true with what we're talking about here. Cheap things really aren't cheap because of the final impact that they have on our community. And our community is really a microcosm of, our, of what's happening with our country. We take all of our money and give it to somebody else, and we take it down to the box store, and they have a big giant truck, you know, they fill the truck up with all of our money and they drive it out of town, we never see it again. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening with our country too. Uh, we have to recycle that money. And again, when one, person, when one of us takes it to another, and that person takes it to another, it compounds itself. And that's the true magic of thinking local first, is the compounding of the money. It's not just one person selling it to another person, it's, it's the circulation through the community. So. We don't have much time, we've just got a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. One concern mm -hmm. though is that uh, a lot of times you are not necessarily selling things that are made locally. So you're selling, you know, people buying it mm -hmm. down the street, but you're bringing the product in from China. So. Uh, there's some things that are local about it, but not, yeah, you know. Well, the, again, the, the money goes to the local person. And I, I think that you would find, and for instance, maybe Eric's story, yeah. that w there is no supply of socks <laughs> made in Santa Cruz. Uh, so y y you pretty much have to do that. How about know? the United States? So there was such a strong Buy American push there for a long time, right after World War II, like Buy American. You don't hear it nearly it, 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 as it's much it's as It's coming back, to. though. Uh, yeah. We hear it all the time in Sock Shop, where are your made in U.S. Mm -hmm. shoes. Um, it, more and more, over the last two to three years, we've heard it a lot. I also started a little sock design business here in Santa Cruz, and I went through the process of trying to get a, find a manufacturer that might reside in the unit U.S. The problem was is I didn't have enough money to create the minimums and the costs. Mm -hmm. So it, I had a choice. Either I didn't start this business or I had to go overseas. I ended up going to South Korea. Um, but my financial center is here in Santa Cruz, and 99% of hosiery manufacturer financial center in New York. So for me to pull some of that money here to Santa Cruz is a benefit to Santa Cruz. Yeah. And, and that's really well, a good I, example of thinking local first. Yeah. We, we, we try to do the best we can. Right, and you and, can't always And you can't, can't always, always do, do the perfect yeah. thing, so you do the next best thing. Well, I want to thank you all. Also, direct people to your website where they can get coupons to, to have discounts Absolutely. at uh, these 500 or many of the different uh, companies Enjoy. that you work with. Um, thanks so much to each yeah. of our guests, all thank board you. members of Think Local First. Thanks again. Thank you for thanks having me. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. And Think Local First. And now it's over to our events reporter, Jessica Vo, with this month's video community calendar.
Firefly Coffee House downtown Santa Cruz with your video community calendar. We are heading into an exciting new year, so come out and celebrate 2011 in Santa Cruz. There will be multiple New Year Eve events, including the annual New Year Eve party at the Coconut Grove. They will be hosting dinner and dancing to a live band from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. If you would like to come out and count down the new year, visit CoconutGroveSantaCruz.com for tickets and details. It's going to be a delicious January jumpstart of many opportunities to eat this month within your community. First, come out to the Kingdom of Fungi. The 37th Annual Fungus Fair will be held at the Ludon Nelson Center on January 7th through the 9th. Enjoy a unique Santa Cruz tradition featuring hands-on mushroom activities, food demonstrations, and much more. For more information, visit scfungusfair.org. The Santa Cruz Mountain Wine Growers are hosting a wine and crab taste off. Join us for a day of wine from Santa Cruz Mountains and crabs specially prepared by your local chefs. You'll be able to try multiple dishes and vote for your tasty favorite. For prices for the taste off, visit scmwa.com. For a sweet event I know you'll be hungry for seconds is the Santa Cruz Chocolate Festival on Sunday, January 23rd from 1 to 4 p.m. UCSC's Women's Club is hosting a day of tasting chocolate samples from over 25 local vendors, door prizes, and live jazz. Don't worry, there's no guilt to your chocolate. All the proceeds benefit scholarships for UCSC. Tickets are as low as $5. Visit SantaCruzChocolateFestival.org for more information. And lastly, the Civic Auditorium will feature Santa Cruz County Symphony's Strictly Classical concert on the weekend of January 29th and 30th. Come listen to Boyce, Beethoven, and Mozart performed by the Pacific Trio. You can learn about tickets and showtimes at SantaCruzSymphony.org. You can learn about these month's events on our community calendar by visiting CommunityTV.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and make sure you're a fan on Facebook, Facebook.com slash CTV Santa Cruz County. I'm Jessica Vo with your video community calendar. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks to all the staff and volunteers at Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Thanks especially to Daniel James Howell and Ryan Mulligan for helping produce the show. Stay tuned each week as we explore issues that affect the world, the nation, but most importantly, Santa Cruz County. I'm Deanna Zachary. And I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. Thanks for watching Community Express.